the kill count, where we tally up the victims in all our favorite horror movies. I'm James A. Janice, and today we're looking at Friday the 13th Part 7, The New Blood, released in 1988. By the late 80s, the Friday franchise had grown long in the machete. Not even the effortful, creative sixth installment was enough to help Jason reclaim his title of Horror King. There was a new top dog in town, and his name was Freddy Krueger. Recognizing this, Paramount attempted a crossover between the two series, but since New Line's Nightmare sequels were taking in twice as much at the box office as Jason flicks, they didn't feel the need to come to an agreement. The plan was scrapped and wouldn't come to fruition until 15 years later. In the meantime, screenwriter Daryl Haney came up with the idea for a pseudo-crossover. Jason vs. Carrie, or at least a Carrie-like character. A final girl with psychic powers. A telekinetic teenager! Associate producer Barbara Sachs okayed the idea and hired John Carl Beekler as the film's director. Beekler, who sadly passed away in 2019, started started his career as a special effects makeup artist. We've seen his handiwork all over the kill count, like in Reanimator, Bride of Reanimator, Demonic Toys, Nightmare on Elm Street Parts 4 and 6, and Halloween Parts 4 and 6. The New Blood was his fourth directorial effort, after a trio of films produced by Charles Band. Though the last film reintroduced Jason as an undead supernatural being, the inclusion of straight-up psychic powers was a step too far for some Friday fans. Personally, I don't mind it, because at least it's something different. The stuff with Tina Shepard, our airsots Carrie White, is by far the most interesting part of this film. Sadly, everything else is a serious step back for the series. It's mostly forgettable, horny teens getting killed by Jason around Crystal Lake. Fucking great. Adding to the disappointment of this installment is that it's nearly bloodless. By this point, the MPAA wore their anti-Friday bias on their sleeve. Parts 7 and 8 are by far the least graphic outings for Jason Voorhees. Which brings us to the big man himself. The Part 6 as Jason actor, C.J. Graham, was beloved by everyone who worked with him. Director Beekler swapped him out with someone he had seen work on the Rennie Harlan film Prison. Many people say we met in prison. While doing effects work for Prison, Beekler saw Hodder offer to put live maggots in his mouth to sell an effect. That kind of dedication stuck with him, so he lobbied hard to hire Hodder. He even did the first ever Jason screen test after Frank Mancuso said Hodder wasn't big enough. Kane Hodder would not only be the first person to play Jason more than once, he'd go on to play the part in four Friday films. It's nuts that the guy most people think of as Jason didn't start until the franchise's seventh film, but Hodder earns the association through his physical performance and the emotion he adds to the character. This Jason is full of rage, straight pissed, and no wonder, he's getting the shit beat out of him left and right. How many kills did Mr. Hodder begin his career as Jason with? Let's find out and get to them. The movie begins with a recap montage, immediately making this feel more like the first four films than the last two. I do like that the narration is done by Walter Gorney, who played Crazy Ralph in parts one and two. A curse on Crystal Lake. A death curse. Knowing that in real life, Fred Krueger was the hip new thing, this self-aggrandizing intro might seem a little desperate, if Jason Voorhees wasn't so legitimately badass. The recap ends reminding us that he's currently anchored at the bottom of Crystal Lake. Then we get the opening credits, and y'all already know what the fuck they about to be. Somehow, this manages to be the worst iteration, thanks to the monotonous, repetitive soundtrack. <laughs> That's all it fucking is, throughout these whole damn credits. Just... Can't blame Harry Manfredini for it either. He was busy scoring Sean Cunningham's Deep Star 6, so all the new music in Friday 7 came courtesy of Fred Mullen. We come out of the credits to find that the J-Man's still underwater, somehow close to a house on shore, even though there was definitely a whole last summer camp there when Tommy Jarvis chained him to the lake bottom. Young Tina Shepard watches as her off-screen parents have a quickly written domestic dispute. Please don't drink anymore! Don't tell me what to do! <gasps> that kind of shallow writing scares Tina into a boat and onto the lake. And when her dad asks her to come back to him and the wife he beats, Tina tells him to fuck off. I hate you! I wish you were dead! She gets a little carried away after that, and her severe looks cause one of those special effects shows you see on the tram tour at Universal Studios. Eventually, the dock gives way, and John Shepard is killed by drowning at the bottom of Crystal Lake. Cause, uh, I guess no one's gonna even try to go in there and save him. Or even retrieve his body. That's cool. Playing young Tina in this opening scene is nine-year-old Jennifer Banco, who would later play Leatherface's daughter in the largely forgotten Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. Ten years later in story, the 17-year-old Tina is on her way back to her family's house on Crystal Lake. She's staying there with her mother and her therapist. Bad news, Chris. 
Dr. Cruz says this exposure therapy will help Tina deal with her dead daddy issues. And if anyone knows about dead guy issues, it's Terry Kaiser, best known as the titular corpse in Weekend at Bernie's. He was also in Tammy and the T-Rex, where he was great. Live! 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 It! Well, that's it. What Dr. Cruz is really after, though, is a way to harness Tina's powers. Because if she gets emotional enough, she can move matchboxes with her mind! And also set them on fire. Damn, you know that room smells good now. That night, Tina gets so frustrated with Cruz that she runs outside and wishes for her abusive father to please come back to life, please. I'm so sorry. I wish I could bring you back. Tina focuses her psychic energies on a body she senses in the lake, only to bring back the wrong dead abuser down there. Jason Voorhees snaps back to reality, and oh, there goes gravity, cause that mofo's floating up to the surface. And the sight of that splashy monster's enough to make a psychic girl faint. Jason's long gone from the lake by the time Tina recovers. She's absurdly unhelpful to her mother and Dr. Cruz. Dr. Cruz, I saw him, but I can't describe him. Really? You can't describe Jason Voorhees? Maybe mention the hockey mask? The linebacker build? The exposed spine? The new blood has my favorite Jason appearance, all decomposed from spending a decade underwater. John Carl Beekler thought it was important to make him look gross and to include all the damage he had endured over the series. I just got tired of seeing, you know, a guy in a gray costume wearing gloves with a hockey mask walking around and it, there was nothing wrong with him. Achieving this gnarly appearance required a multi-step process. They started with a full body cast of Kane Hodder, created a silicone mold out of that, filled that mold with polyurethane foam to eventually create a mannequin, and finally used that mannequin to create foam latex prosthetics for Hodder to wear. So Kane, when you're inside the suit, was it a comfortable experience for oh. you? <laughs> You know it wasn't. Especially not during these underwater shots, which took a whole day to shoot. Hunter had to be bolted to the bottom of the lake, breathing through a scuba system, since the foam prosthetics made him buoyant. If you have to hold your breath as long as you can for, you know, 80 times during a day, it wears you out. I was exhausted after that day, and all I did was sit underwater. The New Blood has one of those The Final Chapter situations, where there are two lakeshore houses unreasonably close together. And you know damn well who's in the house next door to Tina's. A bunch of horny teens just waiting to get killed. There's also a guy named Nick, the requisite bland love interest for our final girl. Like Bill, Rick, and Rob before him, he's a brunette hunk with a monosyllabic name and largely forgettable, especially next to Tina. Beekler fought hard to cast Lar Park Lincoln, who can consulted psychics as research for her role of Tina Shepard. On their advice, she kept her telekinesis face acting on the subtle side. Some actors and crew members said Lincoln was distant and off-putting, but maybe she just wanted to avoid the partying and cocaine that had returned to set. In any case, I think she does a great job as Tina and is one of the bright spots of the film. Nick's not really part of this horny friend group next door. He's the cousin of a guy named Michael who's still on his way there. Michael's played by William Butler, who would also end up in Leatherface Texas Chainsaw Massacre three. His car breaks down, which isn't a big deal for him since he has an egalitarian view towards camping spots. Woods is woods. But his lady Jane admits that there's a reason they're headed to Crystal Lake. This is supposed to be a surprise party for your birthday. Everybody's waiting for us to show up. I got this great cabin and everything. They start the long walk, not knowing that a decrepit swamp man is about to intersect their path. While Michael is off peeing in the woods is woods, Jason finds sweet Jane and kills her by stabbing her in the back of the head. Michael finds her shortly thereafter, pinned to a tree with a tent stake through her neck. Jason then retrieves the stake and chases down Michael, felling him by throwing it into the boy's spine. The last we see of Michael is when Jason retrieves the stake again, because he knows it's going to be windy tonight, and he can't risk having his tent blow away. Nick comes comes next door to invite Tina to his cousin's birthday party, and Tina's mother Amanda lets her go, despite Dr. Cruz being all whiny about it. The relationship between Tina and Amanda is another strength of this movie. I like seeing a mom trying to look out for her daughter. Nick introduces Tina to our future meatbags. There's a spaced out sci-fi writer, a super stoner guy, two ladies who like him occupying opposite ends of the Madonna whore dichotomy, and your standard horned up couple. All of them look so late 80s it hurts. Oh, and they're not around in this first 
her scene for some reason. But there's also one more couple here, Ben and Kate, who are having an ambiguous argument. The last lady to introduce is mean girl Melissa, played by Susan Jennifer Sullivan, who did not die of cancer in 2009, as erroneously reported in the documentary Crystal Lake Memories. Mistakes happen, but that one's worth correcting here. Apparently Ms. Sullivan has simply chosen to lead a private life nowadays. Earlier, Melissa was shown eyeballing Nick's bot, which makes her nasty towards Tina when he brings her to the party. Tina doesn't do herself any favors when she freaks out having a vision of Michael getting killed. Ugh, girls with visions are so weird, Nick. Why don't you get with a girl lacking any kind of vision? Fun fact, that shot of Jason killing Michael in the kitchen was the first thing Kane Hodder ever filmed as the character. He says he feels like he was born to play the part. Tina finds evidence that the murder she envisioned with a tent peg was real, but when Dr. Cruz brings her and Amanda out to look at it, the evidence is gone, with only a tent stake-sized hole left behind. Now it's time for our traditional scene of randos getting killed. In this case, Dan and Judy, who had a bit more of an introduction in a deleted scene where they were shown driving past Michael and Jane. I'm on vacation. I don't want to have to deal with people. By the way, the reason all the deleted footage looks so shitty is because it's from a low-quality work print. Sadly, all the original footage was destroyed, meaning a restored director's cut is impossible. While out getting firewood, Dan is killed by Jason with a neck snap and a fist going through his back. And since Dan had a machete, Jason's now re-equipped with his favorite murder weapon. Thanks, Dan! Jason uses that machete to cut into a tent and abduct Dan's lady Judy in her sleeping bag. He kills her by slamming that sleeping bag against a tree in a kill that Kane Hodder has always cited as his favorite. The exhaustion you see from Jason here is totally authentic, since originally, this kill involved Hodder swinging a sleeping bag filled with six gallons of blood and a heavy mannequin against a tree lined with tiny razor blades many, many times. The MPAA got it cut down to a single swing, which, to be fair, adds an element of simplicity to the kill. One of the rare cases where I thought maybe the edited version ended up better than the unedited. Most of the time though, like with Dan's kill, the MPAA made things worse. They gave the new blood an X rating seven times before it was finally cut down enough for their liking. The worst thing is how unhelpful they were about the cuts. In fact, they sound a lot like YouTube in this regard. They don't make ex explanations for what they do. They just say, well, no, this scene is no good. The next morning, Tina and Nick revel in their lack of chemistry. So where are you from? <laughs> where are you from? Oh, we're doing real good here, aren't we? Whatever, though. For plot purposes, they still need to kiss. Actors Lar Park Lincoln and Kevin Blair Spiritas didn't get along on set. Some say it was because of Lincoln's attitude. Others say it was because Spiritas was dealing with being closeted at the time. Friday 7 is sometimes known as Fry Gay the 13th because of how many cast members were queer. Kevin Blair Spiritas, Susan Bloom, William Butler, Craig Thomas, and Jeff Bennett were all either out or have since come out as gay. Melissa Bull bullies Tina by making fun of her having been to a mental institute, which is enough to make Tina snap. Or rather, enough for her emotional telekinesis to make Melissa's pearl necklace snap. Then Tina runs back to her mommy and cries. She wants to leave this lake entirely, and Amanda supports her decision, but Bad News Cruise threatens to put her back in the institute if she quits. Why don't you just get a mouthful of boob tube, Cruise dude? Even if they can't be graphic and bloody, Jason knows this movie needs more kills. He starts with the preppy Russell and his bubbly girlfriend Sandra. Sandra's played by Heidi Kozak, a screen queen legend in my book, even though she was only in a few movies. She made them count. Prior to this film, she was in Slumber Party Massacre 2, where her whole frickin' head turned into a zit. After this, she'd appear in Society, one of my absolute favorite horror movie oddities. Yay, thank God, yeah. Sandra gets real naked for a skinny dip in the lake, but while Russell's stripping down to join her, J-Man comes out of the woods. He kills the lad by golf swinging an axe into his face. The makeup effects can only be appreciated when Sandra sees his body from afar. But originally, this kill had a lot more gruesomeness, and was given an even better look thanks to a close-up. Jason then appears in the lake, perhaps via teleportation? And kills Sandra after a Jaws-like approach from underneath the water. He pulls her down, and she presumably drowns in the icy water of Crystal Lake. Not a fun death for Ms. Kozak to film. This movie was shot near Mobile, Alabama in February, when it was only 14 degrees outside. There was also a fear of alligators, leading production to hire armed gator wrangler Leslie Busby. Busby later said he got paid to do nothing since gators aren't active in the winter. Dr. Cruz discovers that Tina's portending of danger might have some merit, as Amanda Shepard learns that he's been taking advantage of her daughter. Keeping Tina's trauma and stress levels high, I am 
confident I can induce huge psychokinetic reactions. Oh man, this dude was using your daughter as a science experiment. How's that make you feel, Amanda? You bastard. Aw, oh, you gotta say it more like you mean it. Bastard! Yeah, like that. Tina overhears Dr. Cruz talking shit, so she takes off in the car until her ride is interrupted by another vision. This one of her mother getting stabbed through the back by Jason. It causes her to crash and she runs into the woods because half this fucking movie is people running through the woods. Back at the dandy house of the Randy, the mousy Maddie gives herself a makeover. Earlier, her adventurous friend Robin said she wasn't hot enough for the stoner David. You're not his type. You need a little touch-up work first. <laughs> Why are they both so into this burnout? He's a freaking goober. Columbian Express is pulling out. All aboard. Ding, ding. <laughs> Man, all these motherfuckers goobers. Maddie goes full-blown 80s style and mistakes it for something that's good. Need a little touch-up work my ass. But because her little get-up doesn't include the glasses she needs to see, she gets lost in the woods. Oh joy, more of that. She gets a little taste of that final girl circuit when Russell's body almost falls on her and when Jason steps out to murder her and or offer her directions. She hides in a stable, which you know never works, and she's killed when Jason punches through the wall behind her and swings a sickle into to her stomach, which lands off screen. Jason gets to the Palace of Pleasure, where sex of various degrees of satisfaction are taking place inside and out. The easiest targets for him are Ben and Kate, who are doing it in a van. They stop when they hear a noise, Ben goes outside to check it out, and he's killed by Jason quite simply when he grabs him by the head and squeezes. This kill was super cut down. Its original form, which was fucking sick, used a collapsible mechanical head filled with fake blood and cottage cheese. Ew. Kate pops her head out of the van to see what's up and dies from Jason stabbing her with a party horn. <laughs> Yet another cut down kill. This one almost senselessly. The original version was just a little bit longer. Since Nick hasn't been giving Melissa the time of day, she briefly seduces Eddie in an effort to make him jealous. When that doesn't work, she calls it off and Eddie storms away in his tidy whities In another room, David has put Robin on cloud nine. Well, it was either the D or the weed. I'm really stoned. Maybe both? Robin's played by Elizabeth Caden, who we saw in Silent Night, Deadly Night 2. Her death helped kick off Ricky's Garbage Day Massacre. Day. David leaves her to grab a snack from the fridge, which is where Jason finds him. The big man kills David with a ho-hum stab to the gut. Next, Jason makes his way to the living room, where the rejected Eddie sits opening another man's birthday gifts. Eddie's actor Jeff Bennett would go on to have a very prolific voice acting career, including voicing Johnny Bravo. <laughs> Jason walks up behind Eddie and is all like, Hey there, pretty mama, and kills him by hacking at his neck with a machete. Before the MPAA's meddling, this kill had some extra frames and an additional shot. At this point, there's only Robin left for the Jaybird to kill, in a death scene that had to be reshot since the fake torso they used at first looked bad. They didn't notice until they were back in LA, so Robin's new death scene was filmed at the same house in Topanga Canyon that played the Jarvis home in the final chapter. Robin sees David's decapitated head, and Jason busts in to be like, it wasn't me. Since Robin keeps accusing him with her eyes and screams, the poor guy just can't stand it. He kills her by tossing her from a second story window in the least impressive of this franchise's many defenestrations. Tina and Nick wind up in the woods together where they find his cousin's dead body. Sorry, brah. They get back to her house and learn that Dr. Cruz has been lying to her. He took the tent stake she saw on the side of the house and has known all along about the Crystal Lake killer. It was Jason who Tina saw come out of the lake before she fainted. And it was Jason who's been killing all the sexy teens around them. All these objects shaking though? God, it's you. Yep, that's Tina. Jason can't do shit like that. He can probably teleport though. Tina's mom and Dr. Cruz find her car on the side of the road, an upsetting discovery for Amanda. Tina! Wait, Tina! wait, wait a minute! During their trip through the woods, they're set upon by one Jason Voorhees, who slowly stalks after them with a tree trimmer in hand. Kane Hodder's Jason never runs. Bad News Cruz pulls a real heel move and sacrifices Amanda to save himself. She's killed when Jason stabs through her back with the blade. As with all the others, Amanda's kill was cut down. It came as a disappointment to actor Susan Blue, especially since her death scene was the last thing she ever filmed on screen before switching over to voice acting full time. When Jason finally
finally catches up to Dr. Cruz. He's using a motorized weapon for the one and only time in the franchise. Hotter wanted the loathsome Dr. Cruz to have an extra gory death, so it's a shame that what we get in the film is the tamest weed whacker kill you'll ever see. The shot of his guts coming out had to be cut, but in any case, it leaves Dr. Cruz cross-eyed and painful. Tina has realized by now that this movie needs more running around in the woods, and she stumbles upon her mother's corpse, as well as a few others in various states of dress. This scene full of body discoveries was added by Beekler after the MPAA forced all of the kills to be cut down. It was filmed in Compton months after production wrapped. Tina comes across Jason for their first official showdown to kick off the final and best act of the film. Despite Jason's flashy entrance, Tina quickly puts him down with her mind powers. She then electrocutes him with a wire from a power line, which zaps him good and proper and knocks the big man out. Not for long though, and Tina flees from him into the party cabin. He follows her by leaping straight through the friggin' window. <laughs> Jason's busted his big ass through many a door, window, and wall before, but never have we seen him display ups like this. J-Man Crouch jumped through that thing like this was CSGO. Tina telekinetically flings a couch at Jason and headbutts him with David's decapitated head. That's pretty great. On the porch outside, she collapses a whole goddamn awning on the guy. Holy shit, y'all. That was a human being standing there. And Hodder did not anticipate how heavy the roof would be. It hit me so hard and with such force that it just drilled me into the stairs. In fact, you can see Tina's stunt double Paula Moody visibly react out of concern for Hotter. He says the hockey mask may have saved his life. I could feel my face go on the stairs go bam, bam, bam. <laughs> and it's a good thing I had that on. Tina goes next door to find Nick and Melissa, who's done playing nice and says she's out of this bitch. Peace. She opens the door to find Jason, who kills her with an ax to the head. Then he tosses her ragdoll ass across the room into the corner. They had to cut the shot featuring the ax's actual impact, but I'm glad they kept in that stunt performer's amazing floppy fall. Tina and Nick run upstairs, and when Jason tries to follow, she stops him with a light. It was Hotter's bright idea to get hit in the face and go through the stairs instead of getting hit in the chest and tumbling down them. This nearly resulted in injury when he almost hit the real stairs halfway down. My head had crashed th through the very last balsa wood stair. The one right below that, which is only two inches away, was where the practical one started. So it's a good thing I didn't go any further because I would have really smashed my head on the on the, on the real wood. That's one of the things that makes Hotter so friggin' great as Jason. His willingness to subject his body to a ridiculous number of stunts. Tina uses her mind powers to constrict Jason's mask around his head and squeeze out something nasty. It eventually breaks, letting us see Jason's froggy face. It's the most detailed and monstrous of all of Jason's faces. So hideous, they should probably just hide him in the basement. Ain't nobody wanna look at that, J-Man. Jason pulls Tina down there with him, but no matter how many teeth he gnashes, do just can't match her powers. She uses her mind to send nails into his body and face, then hoses him down with gas from a tank. Huh, should that have been kept in the basement like that? Probably not with an open flame furnace nearby. Good thing Tina's here to give everyone a lesson in fire safety. She lights Jason ablaze in a fantastic fire stunt that actually set a record at the time. Kane Hodder was on fire for more than 40 seconds on set, an insanely long time for a human being to be on fire. This is especially impressive considering he had been seen seriously burned before. While demonstrating a fire stunt for a local reporter in 1977, things went wrong and he suffered burns that left him hospitalized for months and scars on his neck, torso, and hands for life. I don't love this movie, but there's a reason I love Kane Hodder's Jason. He gives his full body to the role. Nick and Tina run out to the dock just in time to avoid the most kick-ass house explosion I've ever seen. Holy shit! They truly blew up an entire house in that movie. It was wild. Once again, the effect was bigger than production anticipated, and they nearly lost the footage. I'm so glad they didn't, though. That kind of fiery force is not something you see every day. The explosion's not enough to put Jason down for good, and he reappears to backhand Nick into a boat so he can focus all his energy on his final girl for this film. She's focusing her energy too, though, on bringing her dad back from the dead. And though he's been down there for a full 10 years, he's just a bit of a dirty man now. He wraps his chains around the 
the indestructible Jason Voorhees and drags him back down into the lake. Good work, Tina. You earned a nappy nap. This lackluster ending was originally a little less stupid, with more logical, disgusting makeup effects on the character of John Shepard. But these effects were vetoed by associate producer Barbara Sachs, who was put in charge of production by Frank Mancuso Jr. He was busy with the Friday the 13th TV series I still have never seen. The movie ends the next morning, in a familiar way, with Tina and Nick being driven away in an ambulance. At Mancuso's request, this scene was originally followed by one in which a fisherman was attacked by Jason. Thank Christ they cut that bit, though. No more swampy jump scares for these endings, I beg of you! With a movie full of new blood to harvest, what were Jason's kill crops like in this film? Let's find out and get to the numbers. Oh, hey, hon. What's up? Oh, God! Telekinetic Teenager! I counted 16 kills in Friday 7 The New Blood, with 8 of the victims male and another 8 female. That gives us an even pie chart, one more way this movie's similar to the first four. With a runtime of 98 minutes, that left us with a kill on average every 6.13 minutes. I'll give the golden chainsaw for coolest kill to Judy. It's not that bloody, but it's memorable in its simplicity. And besides, who am I to argue with Kane Hodder himself? Dull machete for lamest kill will go to Maddie. Pretty disappointing that it cuts outside while the kill occurs. And that's it. Friday the 13th Part 7 The New Blood came out in 1988 after a very condensed production schedule. From pre-production to its theatrical release, there were only six months. That's not enough time to make a movie, man. Jason would have one more adventure under Paramount, a nautical jam that I'll look at next week. Until then, I'm James A. Janice. This has been The Kill Count. On the next Kill Count. Sometimes you need a getaway, a break from life, a vacation. And sometimes a vacation means taking a helicopter to the middle of the desert and sleeping with a married man at his fancy villa. Unfortunately, sometimes that married man turns out to be an asshole with asshole friends who feel entitled to your body. You came onto me like a pussy and it wrapping yourself against me. When that happens, there's only one thing left to do. Take revenge. Revenge is a rape revenge movie, the likes of which have never been covered on The Kill Count before. Compris. Unlike most rape revenge films, though, Revenge was written and directed by a woman. There we go. <laughs> Coralie Farja weaves equal parts feminism and badassery into this stylish, action-packed tale of survival. <laughs> This week, log into Shudder and watch a film full of striking cinematography, bumping music, and inhuman amounts of blood. Then tune in on Sunday for a bonus Kill Count episode, only on Dead Meat. <laughs> Revenge can currently be watched on the pictured streaming platforms. Dead Meat always recommends you watch the movie for yourself before its Kill Count. It's the only way to have your own properly informed opinion. Kill Counts are never meant to replace the experience of watching a film. Thanks a lot for watching this week's Kill Count. I want to thank some patrons like Jonathan Boisvert, Gio Salazar, and Connor Mitchell. We are now more than halfway through the Friday recount, so I'm sprinkling in a little one-off kill count as a treat. It's cool if you don't like that I'm recounting Friday, but please don't call making these videos lazy. I'm not reusing anything from the old videos, not scripts or graphics, I'm not even re-watching them. Every one of these episodes is treated like it's entirely new, and when they come out close to 30 minutes, that is a lot of work for me and my editors. Thanks everyone, be good people.